So I would like to ask you um, if you could tell tell a story or an ex about an experience where um, you've learned something about literacy from creating this archive. <laughs> There is not a day that goes by that I don't learn something from looking at the narratives uh, in the DALN. Um, the uh, literacy is so varied in all its human manifestations. Uh, people learn how to read from cereal boxes and by reading the Bible and by bedtime stories and by um, going to school and by uh, attending Sunday school, by reading in church, you know, by reading instructions. They read in uh, their homes, they read in hardware stores, they read under workbenches in the garage, they read in libraries, they read uh, on playgrounds, in trees, you know, in forts. They read everywhere and they're taught by mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and they're taught by um, by peers, they're taught by uh, Sunday school teachers, they read to dogs and people and um, classes. There's so much variation in the practice and the valuing of literate experiences that you can't help but learn something new every time you listen to one of those stories. And so it's the variation uh, on literacy that most intrigues me. Uh, how um, the activity of signing shapes uh, your literate expressions, values, understandings, ASL. Uh, signing, or how the experience of reading music shapes your understanding of what it means to communicate, or how the experiences and the values surrounding um, alphabetic reading or multimodal uh, reading and composing shapes what you think of as communication, um, uh, shapes what you think of as composing or reading. All that is remains fascinating to me because of its variability. So this archive, it's a digital archive of literacy narratives, and you mentioned why um, why having this digital archive has provided great access and collaboration. Um, but how do you feel the the worlds of digital um, digital studies and literacies intersect or collide? Yeah. Um, from the time when the first fully assembled microcomputers came on uh, the market, the popular market, I don't think from that time forward we could really talk about literacy practices and values without talking about digital context. Because digital context changed and altered and shaped literacy practices and values so dramatically from the very first. It was speed, reach, extension. Uh, it was the velocity with which um, communications went different places. Uh, and that's not to say that everybody had access or that everybody has access to this day because they don't. Access is differentially um, aligned along uh, existing social formations like age, race, um, class, sometimes gender, still in different places in the world. But um, nonetheless, computers have, uh, it's opened up all kinds of uh, uh, environments and networks uh, within which communications can circulate and uh, be distributed and delivered and interpreted and composed uh, in different media, using different modalities, and then um, exchanged with different people. I think that if you, today, if you think you can talk about reading and composing without talking about digital environments, you'd be missing a huge swath of the literacy practices um, and understandings that people 
uh, are engaged in uh, during the 21st century. So what do you think people can learn about um, digital media and technology um, from the DALN? Well, I think first people tell stories about using computers and computer environments uh, to read and compose, just like they tell stories about reading and composing in libraries or at home or anywhere else. And uh, so I think at this point in time, we're at a very interesting point in history where we're making the transition from uh, making a transition <laughs> from print and alphabetic literacy to digital literacy. I mean, that's happening at many levels and in many cultures around the world. Uh, computer networks are one of the uh, factors that contribute to globalized um, uh, sharing of knowledge, right? Not that they're, not that computers are available to everyone, but it's one of the factors that uh, reaches across conventional geopolitical, linguistic, cultural borders. So um, I, it seems to me that um, if you don't study uh, that transition, you'll lose the sense of what it was like before, what it's like now, and what it's going to be like in the future. If nobody is collecting narratives about that, how do you remember, and then how do you uh, compare, and then how do you understand changes that are going to be going forward? And I think that's the value of a project like the DALN. It exists in a point in history where there's a lot of change in the way we compose and the way we read and the environments within which we do so and the purposes for which we do so. So how has your work with the DALN fit into your other scholarly work? Oh. <laughs> uh, I, here, here's what I would say. I would say that um, at this point in my career, I'm going to retire in May of this year. And what I was able, what I've been able to do with the DALN is to do a project that's not for me, but that's for the profession at large. And I, I like doing that kind of project. Uh, the same thing with the computers and composition digital press. If you can do projects that are for the, um, the benefit of the profession at large, uh, there's a great deal of satisfaction in that, and I think it leaves a, a legacy that, uh, I hope it leaves a legacy that far outlives the uh, more um, conventional scholarly work that I've done, the articles I've written, and the, you know, I've written enough journal articles to kill a horse and books and the whole thing. Those things are important, but those things, I think, pale because there's always new research coming out. There's always new work coming out. Those books are going to get old. The journal articles are going to get old, etc. But institutions like the DALN um, that benefit the profession uh, can live on if there are people to look after them and sustain them and contribute to them and participate in them. Uh, and the same with the computers and composition digital press. I would say that it is up to the next generation of scholars to contribute to those efforts. Um, and uh, I, I like to think that every scholar will do a little bit of tending of the communal garden um, looking after things like the digital archive, looking after things like new presses, because each of those projects takes a lot of work. Sandra Pearl's writing tree. Um, they don't uh, persist and evolve on their own. They require um, input and effort and the, the ideas of individuals. And um, while young scholars are busy uh, writing their own articles in their own books because they have to do that for tenure and promotion. I hope they save a little bit of time as well to contribute to those more, uh, those communal projects that um, 
um, provide ground for the whole profession to prosper.